I want to say good morning to all of you who have assembled here in the building. We're happy to see you here today, as well as those who have joined us on Zoom. And we're, uh, we're gaining a few, it seems, every week, and hopefully doing that safely. And if we will continue earnestly praying for the, this pandemic to go away and get better, uh, surely it will. Ron's, Ron's going to be leading our songs today, and in a moment he'll be beginning that. Uh, Daniel Jones is going to read scripture for us. At the appropriate time, Paul will lead us in our first prayer. Quick scripture just to begin with us today from the book of Revelations, chapter 3, and the message that was sent to the church at Laodicea, part of what was said to them is, verse 21, He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Good morning. Would you please uh, join me as we praise our great God, Lord, and Creator this morning by singing number 111 in the supplement, This is Holy Ground. No. This is holy ground, we're standing on holy ground, for the Lord is present, and where he is, is holy. This is holy ground, we're standing on holy ground. And where he is, is holy. You are holy God, a perfect and holy God. We will come before you with hearts made clean by Jesus' blood. You are holy God, a perfect and holy God. We will come before you with hearts made clean by Jesus' blood. Hosea 5, verses 8 through 15. Blow the ram's horn in Gibeah, the trumpet in Ramah. Cry aloud at Beth Haven, look behind you, O Benjamin. Ephraim shall be desolate in the day of rebuke. Among the tribes of Israel I make known what is sure. The princes of Judah are like those who remove a landmark. I will pour out my wrath on them like water. Ephraim is oppressed and broken in judgment because he willingly walked by human precept. Therefore, I will be to Ephraim like a moth and to the house of Judah like rottenness. When Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah saw his wound, then Ephraim went to Assyria and sent to King Jareb, yet he cannot cure you nor heal you of your wound. For I will be like a lion to Ephraim and like a young lion to the house of Judah. 
I, even I, will tear them and go away. I will take them away, and no one shall rescue. I will return again to my place till they acknowledge my offense. Then they will seek my face. In their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. Let's continue our worship this morning by singing number one in the main song book, Holy, Holy, Holy. No, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to Thee. Before we go to the, our Heavenly Father this morning in prayer, please join me in singing number 125, Near, Still Near. Do, do, me, near, still, Thy blood doth him. 
Righteous, holy, loving, and kind, dear Father in heaven, we approach thee in prayer this time of our worship unto you, thanking you for the blessings you've given unto us as we extol you as the one who has created all things, that you continue to sustain all things, and the one, O oh, oh God, who is perfect in all ways. We thank you, dear Lord, for the fact that you are a shield to your children to those who are obedient, and you can deliver. As we think about your mercy, we're certainly thankful, dear Lord, for the fact that you have uh, exemplary, exemplary, loyal love. We thank you for your mercy, for your long-suffering nature. We pray that as we have, whether great illnesses or great pain in our lives, we do beseech your mercy. We thank you, dear Lord, for the many, many ways of, as you express your love unto us, your expectations for us, the way in your word that you admonish us, show us both reward and punishment as to how we choose to align ourselves with your will or in the cases of mankind, as, as mankind may ridicule you, separate themselves from you, what the what the eternal consequences are. And as we think about life, our short lives, may we think about the fact that the time to praise you is when we're living because the grave does separate us from that. So may this morning as we worship you this morning, may we prepare ourselves in our mind and in our actions to, to do so. Proper decorum, the proper appreciation, proper fear as we do offer our worship unto you. We pray for encouragement, dear Lord, as we're living, for the fact that as Christians we, we may be reviled. As we think about Jesus, both reviled and ridiculed as you have been, uh, Jesus is the one who atones us as we obey the gospel and whom we can be forgiven of our sins. And we do pray as we approach you in our worship today that you forgive us, dear Lord, of our sins, that you hear our supplication, that you answer our prayer. We pray that as we engage in our worship, as we study from your word, that we do so in, in a way that's uh, beneficial to us, that we grow as Christians in our service to this church and in the kingdom. And it's this prayer which we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Before we eat the Lord's Supper together this morning, remembering the death, burial, and resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ, please join me in singing number 189, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, 189. After we sing this song, we'll eat the emblems together. No. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count. Before we begin, does anyone not have the emblems for this morning? If, you're, if you need these, just raise your hand. Someone will bring it to you. And also, if you've not used these before, there's two covers here, a very thin one on top, which you raise first, and that will expose the little wafer of bread, and then the heavier foil column, uh, cover that will expose the wine. The Lord's Church is unique in this world that we live in today because we strive to do what the Lord commanded, either personally or through His apostles, and to follow the example of the New Testament Church. The New Testament Church, everywhere you read of it throughout the book of Acts, they were meeting on the first day of the week, which we are today. And one of the things that they did there was to partake of these emblems, which were given to us by the Lord on the night He was betrayed. For us throughout the thousands of years to remember His death for us. And so at the end of the Passover meal, which they had taken, Jesus with His disciples, He took of the bread 
and the fruit of the vine. And this is described in several places in the Gospels, but uh, in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul d describes this, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. And of course, at that time, Paul was not in the remiss because he was still out uh, being a, a Pharisee. But he became a Christian, and he's saying here, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So it's very important that we remember as we partake of this. It's real easy to be caught up in uh, so many things that cross our memories. But as we partake of the bread and the fruit of the vine, remember his sacrifice for us. Let's give thanks for the bread. Our Father in heaven, we are thankful for this bread, which symbolizes to us the body of Christ hanging upon the cross, the body of Christ that was so beaten and hurt for each of us. Be with us as we partake of this bread, Father. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let's give thanks for the fruit of the vine. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful for this fruit of the vine, which symbolizes to us the blood which was shed by our Savior. Help us, Father, to remember his sacrifice for us and all that he endured because of our sin. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. And this concludes the Lord's Supper. Before uh, Brother Bill's message to us this morning, uh, I'd like us to sing a great song about heaven. Number 227, There Is a Habitation. And if it's convenient for you, I would ask you to stand with me as we encourage one another and uh, help one another to keep our focus on our goal. There's coming a day, a time, maybe this very hour, when the Lord returns, we get to rise up in the air and meet him and go on to heaven forever and ever. There'll be no more sickness, no death, no more viruses, no more strokes, and all the difficulties and challenges of this temporary world. But a day when we'll be with the Lord, the saved of all ages, praising him forever and ever in that glorious place we call heaven. There is a habitation. We're going to sing this song and then turn the time over to Brother Bill. Though there is a habit. 
habitation built by the living God for all of every nation who seek that grand abode. Zion, Zion, I long thy gates to see. Zion, Zion, when shall I dwell in thee? A city with foundations firm as the eternal throne, no wars nor desolations shall Stone. Oh, Zion, Zion, I long thy gates to see. Oh, Zion, Zion, when shall I dwell in thee? Within its pearly portals angelic me sing with glorified immortals the praises of its king Zion Zion I long thy gates to see Zion, Zion, when shall I dwell in thee? Be seated, please. Roger, we want to welcome all of you here. We appreciate the fact that you've come to be with us. And those that are joining us uh, live stream, we are glad that you're looking in on us. Uh, if you have your Bibles, we'll turn to the book of Nehemiah, the third chapter. We're going to take our lesson from there. Nehemiah is such a great book. As we said to you in the beginning, that this is his memoirs. This is his autobiography uh, with reference to rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem after Ezra under Zerubbabel and others had finally rebuilt the temple and that the walls were now going to be built that would once again uh, give it some prominence in terms of its place in the scheme of redemption. And so as we look at the book of Isaiah, especially the third chapter, uh, we're not going to read all of this. You're glad, you'll be glad to know if you've looked at it at all, or if you skim through it now, you'll be glad to know that we're not going to read very much of this. This is a list, which are common in that day, especially if you think about what, what does, does this list matter? Why are we reading this list? Why is this list here? Why is this part of inspiration? Why, why should we even bother with chronologies and uh, all of those things or um, uh, with uh, accounts of lists and that sort of thing that we find in the Bible? I mean, do they really matter? I mean, after all, they're just a list of names that have been long forgotten. So what's the point? Well... Names are important because they have a story. And in particular, they fit into God's story. And it's a reminder to us that there were people going about their everyday lives just like you and I are, best we can under some 
tough circumstances. And they were living under some tough circumstances too. And these are the people that said, let's rise and build. And these were the people that did and were committed to it. And so you have a good number of people that are here. It's a reminder of the sincerity of their commitment. In chapter 2 and verse 18, where I mentioned just a moment ago when they said, let's rise and build. Uh, we are his servants, is what Nehemiah said in chapter 2 and verse 20 to the opposition as they raised its head and we're going to see in the next chapter. Uh, they were an example for the future. They had left the comforts of their environments. Some of them had traveled great distance, eight different locations from different places that are mentioned in this list. From Tekoa to Jericho to uh, Gibeah and other places as well. They had come to rebuild this wall, to, to leave the comforts of their home, to be affected by what Nehemiah had said to them. It was important for generations to come to remind them of their parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles and all of those that participated. Something to hand down as to why we do what we do, but that does not that is not what makes it right. It's just who these people were and what they believed. I guess part of my mind is I have to speak tomorrow at a funeral in Dothan and thinking of the legacy of the Tomleys and the, the children they had and, and how this is playing out in their grandchildren who are now older and even great grandchildren who are old enough to remember their grandparents to be able to tell them about the faith of their of their great grandparents, and uh, some of them, even them, are getting old. I mean, getting up there in age, and great great, and they'll still remember them. And so, those are important reminders for people to remember the names and what certain things are associated with that kind of memory. I mean, you read the list in the in the New Testament of various names that are there. Uh, whether, especially Romans 16 is probably one of the longest ones, where all these different names are mentioned, but they're important names. As I said to you, names have a story. They're, they're important to the one who's writing them. These were important people to Nehemiah. I mean, they had given of themselves. They, had, they were willing to follow. They were willing to commit. They were willing to make sacrifices to see that the wall was being built. These were important people to Nehemiah, to who he was as a leader. They were an encouragement one to another. They were an encouragement to, to others in, in, in other lands. But probably in all likelihood, this list was composed for all the reasons that I said, but also to give a report to King uh, Artaxerxes and to give him a record of how He's faring, that he's not just gone on vacation, but there is work being done. And so that Artaxerxes knows what's going on. I think the other interesting thing about them rebuilding this wall is there is no, there's no material incentive given at all. The only two things that are given as reason for doing it is we are in trouble. That is, we are a disgrace. We are... We are a reproach with our wall broken down. We're, we're, we're living in our homes and we're not doing anything about this. And, and here to just imagine people, what, what is that city over there? Look at those walls are torn down. Look at that pile of mess over there. Look at those rocks that are just piled up there. What's, what is that city? And so he said, we're in trouble. This isn't who we are. We're, 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 we're the people of God. We need to reflect that. And I think the second thing is, is that not only for their own dignity, but for the glory of God. Now, I, I don't think our dignity comes before the glory of God for this simple reason. That I, I don't think that you can really achieve the greatest potential of our, or any of us can achieve the potential of our dignity without making glory 
to God first. We'll never, we'll never get there. I think that's the point, isn't it, of Romans 1, where he talks about the Gentile nations who uh, did not acknowledge God. They had the opportunity. They, they began worshiping the creature rather than the creator. And what happened? They lost the dignity of their being. They turned and engaged in immorality of, of the basest sorts. And, and the whole list that is there at the end of the chapter, without natural affection, uh, covenant breakers, I mean, you couldn't trust a single word they said. They, they didn't love the, the, like they should have loved. They were without natural affection. That, that would be a mother leaving her children or aborting her children would be without natural affection. So all of those sort of things would be uh, involved in uh, when we lose sight of, of who we are because we don't know who God is. One last thing on this before I go into my lesson as the way, by way of introduction. You remember in 1 Samuel 17 when, when David was sent to take provisions to his brothers as they were fighting in the war. They weren't really fighting. They were quaking in their boots because of Goliath and the Philistines. You remember David's statement there? You know, what will the king give? And who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God. In other words, what's the point of an army if you're not going to take on this guy? And secondly, if somebody whips this guy, what, what's the reward for it? I mean, David is interested in that. Of course, they said the king would give him great riches and then give him one, one of his daughters for marriage. But be that as it may, David understood what? He said, we have fallen into reproach. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? I mean, if for nothing else, we've fallen into reproach. That's, we're in trouble. Our, our reputation here. God's glory is at stake here. And so let's think about that. So under the leadership of Nehemiah, the planning and the praying and the protection, he inspired a number of things in the people. One of the first things we recognize is, and we'll read a couple of these, but in Nehemiah 3, verses 1 through 2, which starts this chapter, and it, and it just sort of sets the tone for the rest of the chapter. It says, Then Eliashab, the high priest, rose up with his brothers, the priests, and they built the sheep gate. They consecrated it and set, it door, and set its doors. They consecrated it as far as the Tower of the Hundred and as far as the Tower of Hanel. And next to them, the men of Jericho built. And next to them, Zakur, the son of Emery built. I mean, that's pretty much everything I want to talk about in the lesson is right there. But I'll make reference to some other passages throughout there, and I, as you'll see on my chart as well. But that really is the, that, that's the sermon right there. Number one, I mean, you see that they have the builders have their priorities. Here is Elisha, the high priest. He's not sitting back and letting somebody else do it. He's involved. He's a leader himself. And he's responsible. And so he, he rose up with his brothers, the priests. And they built the sheep gate. Interesting that they would build the sheep gate. But I think what it says is our priorities are all about God. What do you think the sheep gate was? It's where the sheep that were given for offering and sacrifice to God came through. And so they were taking care of their relationship with God before anything else. Their priorities were all about who God is and about serving God and putting God first in their life. And so when you think about who God is, you come to a greater appreciation for, for uh, what it is that God wants us to do, for the things of God. Jesus told Peter, get behind me, Satan. For thou art a rock of offense, for thou mindest not the things of God, but the things of men. So when you, you don't take notice of the things of God, you, you become a place of stumbling for other people. But not in the case of the, of the priest who had made such a miserable wreck of everything that was leading to their captivity. That led 70 years ago to the captivity, prior or actually more than that, 80 some years, almost 100 years ago from the time of Nehemiah, it was the priests and their failure. But now we see this high priest, Elisha, 
coming to set a good example. I tell you, spiritual leaders, spiritual leaders, and I should say it this way, of spiritual leaders, there's more required than just talk. If they are, uh, they, they are to be as good as their message. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 27, I think it's the last verse in the chapter. Lest when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Paul said, I'm trying to practice what I preach. And leaders who don't practice what they preach are horrible leaders. I'm just telling you how it is. They're just horrible. And so that's what we find in these priests. They were as good as their message. They were, and as such, they were encouraging people. They were an encouragement to people. So when we have priorities, you want to encourage people, set the right priorities. God first, as they were doing. And I'll tell you something else that we find in this text. Relative to Elishab, especially. I probably got it in my notes and I may repeat it when I get to it again. But this made me think about it. When you read through this text, you know, one of the things they're doing is uh, they're building the wall closest to their house. Not Elisha. Not Elisha. He doesn't. He takes care of God. So I don't think he's trying to be anything but, but a high priest and be a good leader. I think he's expecting. I mean, the work had to be organized some way. And who do you want building the wall in front of your house except you anyway? You're going to have to look at it every day. And so you're not going to do shoddy work. You're going to do the best work you possibly can. But I am saying that he wasn't concerned about himself as much as he was as he was about God. Now these people were all concerned about who God was. They were doing the work. I, I don't want to misrepresent this. But Eliashab, when you go over to chapter 3... In verse 19, he said, Next to him, Ezra, the son of Jeshua, ruler of Mizpah, repaired another section opposite the ascent to the armory at the buttress. After him, Baruch, the son of Zabbi, repaired another section from the buttress to the door of the house of Eliashab, the high priest. And after him, Merimoth, the son of Uriah, son of Hakaz, uh, Hakaz, repaired another section from the door of the house to Eliashab to the end of the house of Eliashab. It's not till the end of the chapter here that, that his house is getting worked on. His first concern, and rightfully so, is to take care of the things of God. That, that was his job. That was his responsibility. So he had priorities. And when we have those priorities, we can be an encouragement to other people. We can set a great example and be the kind of leader that we need to be. Secondly, there is this vast teamwork and unity that's involved here. I'm not sure that we totally appreciate all of this, but you think about it and you read through this whole text, and there's a variety of people there, different backgrounds and different levels of skill. Some were unskilled. They were from various locations, eight different locations, as I said to you a moment ago, uh, worked on this project. And they came together and got it built. They got it done. They worked together. I mean, and, and nobody was envious of the job that somebody else had. I said to you that there were skilled laborers and there were unskilled laborers. We have goldsmiths, perfumers, and, and others that are mentioned here in the text. But let me tell you something else. None of them could do their work if the pile of junk and rubble didn't get cleaned up. I don't care how good a goldsmith you are, if you don't have a good place to work, I don't care how good of a carpenter you are, if that mess is, so you had unskilled labor that they were dependent upon. And nobody said of others, you know, or mistreated anybody at this point. They were dependent, they were interdependent for the work that each could provide and could do. Nobody looked down their nose at anybody, nobody thought that they were better because they had a more skilled position. Nobody 
made somebody feel inferior because they did have a skilled position and the other didn't. It was teamwork, it was unity, and from different backgrounds, from Jericho down uh, the, the road and then over to the east, uh, other places. And, and listen, they, I don't know, they probably didn't always have the same kind of uh, habits of doing certain things. You know, but nobody got mad or angry with somebody because they didn't do it the way they thought they, thought they should do it. They were putting forth and getting the very best out of their work and out of their uh, attention to, to the detail and to the job. Verses 1 through 19. Verses 1 through 19. Fifteen times next to him or next to them is mentioned. I, I'm not going to read all of them, but I hear, hear starting in verse 2. And next to him, the men of Jericho built. And next to them, Zachur, the son of Emery built. Down in verse uh, 4. Uh, Meshulam, the son of Bechariah, the son of Shezebel, repaired. And next to them, Zadok, the son of Bana, repaired. And next to them, the, Te- the, Te- uh, uh, the Tekoites. 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 So you, you have that all the way through. Sometimes it says next to him. Uh, for instance, in verse 17, after him the Levites repaired Rehum, the son of Benai. Next to him, Hashabiah, ruler of the half district of Kelah, of Kelah. So you, you have that 15 different times, 10 times next to them, five times next to him. But, but the point, the, 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 you, you get the point? We're talking about unity. We're talking about teamwork. They're arm in arm. They're shoulder to shoulder. And they're working together. And they're not trying to correct somebody or look over somebody else's shoulder to see what they're doing. They're busy doing their work. The completed wall was a testimony to the interdependent partnership with all of these people working together who came from all different places and from all different levels of skill. It's a testimony to them. And so there's another reason for this list. I think also, as I said, good leadership understands the limits of those with whom they're working. And they know what they can and cannot do, and so they don't expect them to do something that they cannot do. It's important if we work together as a team But all of us recognize our limits. And that we work commensurate with the talents that we have. There are a lot of talents I don't have. Not everybody has to be able to preach the gospel in order to go to heaven. You know, you don't have to be able to be a preacher to go to heaven. You don't have to be a deacon. You don't have to be an elder. You don't have to be a soul leader to go to heaven. Or to build. Just because somebody will get up in front of an audience and do what you've asked them to do doesn't necessarily mean they should. Elders have to make that decision. And it's not easy. But it needs to be made. I mean, you know, I remember years ago... uh, Brother Homer Haley went to hold a meeting somewhere and uh, this, these people had built a relatively nice building for the size of them. And they had, I don't know, seven, eight classrooms. One of the members said to Brother Haley, said, Brother Haley, don't you think we ought to have eight classes going on right now before our kids and so forth? Brother Haley said, well, he said, uh, of course, you'd have to know Brother Haley. He said, well, how many teachers you got? He said, you can only have as many classes as you got teachers. And that's right. 
That's right. Oh, you can put somebody up in there, and you can put somebody in a classroom. But if they're not convicted and they're not living and walking the talk, why do you want that? Just to get somebody up is not, is not the object. It's getting people talking and getting people moving and working together and being a team and helping one another. We see in this teamwork and this unity, there is an unselfishness on the part of these people. That they weren't so filled with pride that they had to assume that they could do something that they couldn't do. They were unselfish in the sense that, as I said, they came from long distances to, to contribute to working on the wall. They were unselfish in, in the time that they gave. In fact, some of these people, as you'll read through the text, would work on one part of the wall and get it finished, and they'd run over and work on another part. There's about four times that's mentioned in the text. I mean, then these were people that had come from some distance, some of the Tokoakites, Tokoakites, did that. They started working, and they finished their work, and then they ran over somewhere else and started helping somebody else. That's what they did. Then they said, well, I'm done. I've got mine done. I've just met my status quo. You know, I'm, I'm doing just what everybody else done. I've done my work. I've had my time. I've taught my sense of Bible classes, and now I'm over. Let, let, let somebody else do it. I'm not going to do that. We'll just leave it to two or three to do it. I've spent my time. I've paid my dues. I don't need to participate in that. I don't need to help the teachers. I don't need to, you know, Whatever. So we think about the fact that they were willing to invest their time and this unity. You know, one of the things, again, about this unity is that it was not a uniformity. There was a diversity of interest of those that were engaged in the work. I mean, some participated on, on the basis of family association. Others were just merely individuals next to him, to an individual, you see. Uh, some were associated with their districts. They were, had, had positions of power. Others had uh, other standings in, in, within their community. Some had a professional association. That is, they had a particular skill. So here, they didn't all look the same. They didn't all do the same. Uh, but they worked together. That's the point. And there's always going to be disappointment from within when you work with people. It's just the nature of working with people. Uh, there's going to be those that are going to be a disappointment to you. You can turn over to chapter 3 and look at verse 5. And next to them, the Tekoites repaired, but their nobles would not stoop to serve the Lord, stoop, serve their Lord. That's not Jehovah, that's not what they're saying. The Lord, those who were rulers over them, the masters of the plan, Nehemiah, particularly. Uh, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't stoop to help them. They wouldn't put their shoulder to the task. I'm not going to do it. I don't like him. You know what he said about me 25 years ago? Ah, if I'm not having anything to do with him. Or her, whatever the case may be. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna work with them. Besides that, you know who I am. It's beneath my dignity to have to get down and stoop to, to do this kind of work. I'm not fit or suited to do this menial labor, menial labor. Well, it's true. Some people aren't by reason of health and age, and so everybody understands that. But to take the attitude that I'm not doing it because of. I, 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 it's beneath my dignity. That's another thing. That's pride. And I'll tell you, pride's going to ruin a lot of us. You know, it's just pride. It's not, it's not even the fact that they're indolent or that they're lazy. It's just their attitude toward it. I've done my time. Well, you know, there are a lot of people here in this congregation that do the same thing over and over and over again and get no relief get no notoriety. They just keep on doing what they do. They're not expecting it. Maybe we should do a better job of recognizing that. I, I would be in favor of that. Uh, because we do have a lot of people behind the scenes 
I mean, I've had people say to me, you know, uh, brother so-and-so, when this just happened the other day, he has been so good to me. I it just seen after me getting things done that need to be done. I had no idea. No idea. Oh, I know that goes on all the time. But to sit back and say, I'm going to do nothing. I, I, there are people that just talk and talk about spirituality. And when it comes to doing something, they're not going to do a thing. They won't walk the, they won't walk the talk. They're not involved. They think, well, you know, I, I, I teach one quarter a year. That's all I need to do. Well, you know, we've got teachers that are teaching three and four quarters a year. You ever taught a Bible class, a children's class? You're not too old to learn. There's some people here, we've got some great teachers here. They'll help you learn how to do it. The question is, will you say, let's rise and build up? Let's rise and build. So we think about that, and then we have the fact that the commitment of these people. You look at chapter 3, beginning at verse 10. It says, next to them, Jedidiah, the son of Haroth, repaired opposite his house. And next to him, Haddish, the son of Hashbaniah, repaired. And then you look at verse 23. And the text reads, uh, after them, Benjamin and Hasha repaired opposite their house. Again, this is just pointing out how many times uh, next to their house or across from their house. This text points out over and over again. Uh, Several places opposite their house, uh, opposite their house. Look at verse 29, uh, verse 30. So, you know, the point that I make there, those are the people who are really uh, doing this work, uh, committed, and they're going to make it look as best as they could. There's not going to be any shoddy work here. They're going to have to look at it day after day. They don't want that wall falling in on their house. They want anything happening to them. So you see, just, you know, let somebody else do it. No, that never even entered their mind. And they didn't worry about what somebody else did or didn't do. They just, they just saw what needed to be done and they did it. They didn't worry about somebody getting credit or not getting credit for it. They just, they just saw what needed to be done and they did it. And so what he's reminding us is that, you know, sacrificial service uh, is not dependent upon anybody else. Uh, you, you do what you can. Uh, they had, as I said, they had experts. Chapter 8, I mean, verse 8, it says, Next to them, Uzal, the son of Hariah, goldsmiths, repaired. And then you have down in verse, uh, uh, well, the same verse. Uh, Hananiah, one of the perfumers, repaired, and they restored Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. I mean, I don't know where these people lived and came from, these professionals. But they were there to help and, and to do what they could. You also have in verse uh, 32. Uh, the text says, in between the upper chamber of the corner and the sheep gate, the goldsmiths and the merchants repaired. So you had all sorts of business people there. You had people that had various uh, construction ability and so on. But they were willing to sacrifice and do what they could do. And so the enthusiasm of it all. Then you look at verse 4. And next to them, Miramoth, the son of Uriah, son of Hakaz, repaired. You know why, you know why that name's important? Uh, there's another name that's important, too, in this text, Malchijah. Malchijah, 13, 14 years earlier, had got caught up in Ezra's trying to reform the people when they went off and married foreign women. And he repented of it, obviously, gave up his wife, and then came back and began serving the Lord over. Merimoth, on the other hand, uh, his grandfather, was somebody who, and he was a priest. These are priests, by the way. Uh, and so his, fa his grandfather had, had married out of Israel. And in the second chapter of the book of Ezra, I think verse 59 through 62, 
mentions the fact that these that were there in that list were considered unclean because they had married outside. But Uriah, his father, finally got the bloodline going and he was able to serve. I mean, it was sort of a, you know, a shame that his grandfather had done that. People knew that. So here's my point to, to mention those two things about Malchijah, Malchijah and about Miramar. And that is, Malchijah, in his case, he didn't let the past define him. His failure and what he did in committing uh, egregious sins and, and going over and, and marrying foreign women and, and doing the things that he did. Terrible as it was and had to repent of it, was rebuked for it, and yet we find him doing the right thing. He's, he, and then you find uh, Miramoth, who, who has probably in some ways been looked down upon because of his grandfather everybody knew was unclean. Was he really a priest or was he, you know, no telling what kind of sneer, but there he is working. So my point is their, their past is not going to define them. They're going to work for God. They're going to make it right, their lives right, and they're going to do what's right, regardless of, of, of the criticism or what anybody else says or whatever else has happened in their life or how their ancestors have behaved and, and the shame that they, and the guilt that they've had to carry for that. They were men that had a past. But they also were men who saw the potential for a great future with God. So let me just close real quick. I'd love to take the time, but these, the, that, those four passages are sermon themselves. This is the application. I will read the Romans passage, Romans 12. When I, when I read Nehemiah 3, this is the, these are the passages from the New Testament that I think about. You can write them down. Romans 12, verses 4 through 8. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 through 7. Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. And 1 Peter 4, verses 9 through 11. And here's, here's the Romans 12 passage. That begins by saying... For by the grace given to me, I say to every one among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, and don't all have the same talent, and don't all have the same abilities. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them in prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Whatever your talent is, whatever your gift is, use it. We need it. Don't think it's too small, and certainly don't think it's so big that we can't do without it. I'm going to stop there because if I get started, we won't get out of here on that note. But these are passages that, that discuss the fact of having the kind of mind of unity and oneness that God intends for us to have and to work together and to serve God uh, together and, and be what he wants us to be. I never know the minds and the hearts of those that are in the audience, those of you that may be looking in on the live stream. We have our address there somewhere for you to look at, and, and if you need to contact somebody some way, we can help you. You just need to let it be known. We'll do what we can uh, to talk with you and so forth. If you're here in the audience, you need to respond uh, in some way. We invite you to come. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. What a great old hymn. Love that song. Have thine own way, Lord. Consecrate now to thee. How about you? If you died right now, would you go to heaven? If not, you can change that. Will you come to him now while together we stand and while we sing? Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I 
in the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still, have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Search me and try me, Master, today. What a good song that was, particularly the ending, Christ only always living in me. May we all strive for that goal and be diligent in prayer that it might be accomplished in our own lives. I'm going to briefly give some updates on some of the things that we might know already. Uh, I'll do that after we have our closing prayer. I'm about to bypass that. We are thankful for everybody being here this morning. We have visitors with us. We thank you for being here and worshiping with us today. We would invite um, everyone listening. This will be a Zoom meeting only at five today for Bible study in the book of First Timothy. So if you haven't read that, you might do so this afternoon and be prepared for that discussion at five this afternoon. I'm going to ask Brother Matthew Conley to lead us in closing, and then I'll make the announcements. Let's bow our heads humbly in prayer. Our Holy Father in heaven, we are grateful we've had this opportunity to come out, praise your name in song, prayer, We've even been given an opportunity to give. We're grateful, Father, that we had a memorial to your son, Jesus, which is the bottom of it all for us. Not the bottom in that it's rock bottom, but the bottom that it should be our foundation in life. We are grateful to you, Father. May we ever remember that as we work, as we've been taught this morning to build, that our building as humans, we need to build your kingdom by finding more souls to be added to it. Help us to always remember that and be grateful for the grace that you provide to us. So many times we take it for granted, Father, but you are awfully graceful. You've been good to us in this nation where we live, and we should be ashamed of some of the things that are go on in it. Have mercy on us, Father. May we all pray and understand and know and love you and your goodness. We pray for all of those who've been mentioned as being sick, those who have ongoing physical problems. And we always pray for our elderly master. Thank you, Father, that you have granted us goodness, love, and kindness. 
And we take it so much for granted so often. We pray your blessings on those who realize and want to do your will in their lives and show that expression through their daily conduct. Have mercy, we pray, and bless them. Thank you for all you do for us. We are especially grateful for this congregation here of your people who love and respect one another and think of it as only doing their daily duty. Please continue to bless us, we pray. Through the name of your son, Jesus, who so willingly gave his life that we would be able to do the same. It's in his holy name that we're offering this prayer. Amen.